All right, here we go. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker up on TSN 2 all afternoon. Brian Hayes, Zero Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan. A little Leonard Skinner to get I us. I love it. Shredding <laughs> right off the bat. I love it. No lyrics. And those are all Doogie's choices. 19-year-old Doogie. Yeah. He's an old school rock, and he's an old soul, as they say. If, if you didn't know him, you'd think he's just a stoner. Like, you know, like a, <laughs> if you went to high school with him, he would be like, now growing up, they were called skids. He would be a skid for sure. Like a old stoner. Old school, though, noodles. Not, yeah, not like, in the 80s. Like, th- this is music. This guy graduated in 1972. Yes. You like, know, he's a <laughs> but hippie. Like, long hair, you know, Iron Maiden, ACDC t-shirt on, oh, smoking. Further back than and, that, man. That's what I'm saying. That's so you're Leonard talking Skinner. like. This guy's an yeah, Allman Skinner. Brothers fan. He's oh, old school, yeah. man. This guy, he might have been in Woodstock for all we know. I Did saw he? an old school rat tail at Sobeys today. I like it. Wow. Completely bald. And I was doing the self-checkout, and he was like face his, this bald head was facing me. I looked and I go, he has a rat pony, a rat tail pony at the back end. It was old. <laughs> That's school, a lifestyle, man. man. That's a lifestyle choice. That's letting the world know this is what I'm about. You can judge a book by its cover if you choose to, but uh, I'm up for a good time. And <laughs> what did, did it see? look like on top though? It's like no, there's completely no hair. bald, totally bald skullet. And then a rat, pony on the back it I like was it. it was it was different wow. and it was his vibe and he rocked it and he he owned it <laughs> that's summer in toronto man that that's exactly it everyone's in a good mood everyone's feeling great um you see your boy brant snedeker went messy eh? i sent you that pic the other day brant just decided to take it right down to the shed i love it well brant was one of the originators of this like quaff that these young kids have where it's just like forward poofs and everywhere. I don't even know what this hairstyle is that these 15 to 17 year old kids have, but Sneds was one of the original down south kind of old school mullets. And he just went he went messy? Yeah, he did. Wow. I'll find the pick, but yeah, get there he is. Look at oh, him. Living his best life. Wow. It looks but good. But he's not bald. Like, he's not balding or anything, is no, he? Like, I, was he? he just, I think it was just a choice, Noodles. He said, screw wow. it, man. I'm I'm going to see what this whole world is about. And uh, Dude, I, I think that, that that's the appropriate decision. Anyone that tries to fold over bacon strips and make it look like they have a real salad it's the wrong move. <laughs> I, I just like I, I think Dude, you get be... in a pool with some wind and you get out. You are a nightmare. It's nightmare fuel. <laughs> I just I think there are people that <laughs> if there are bald people who are mad about a guy who's got a gorgeous set of hair and just just shaves his head. Right. Like they think it's disrespectful. I because, can understand that. Right. It's like right? wearing glasses that. Or you don't need fashionable, exactly fashionable like, glasses. I totally think the problem is, and I I have a ton of respect. Like it must not be easy. People care about stuff like this, and it's serious stuff. But they think that they're taller than they are, because when you've got a short guy who's folding over bacon strips, and we're <laughs> all like six feet tall or six one. And you're looking down and you see the strips folded over and you just want to say, I can see that. <laughs> yes, the whole world but can I, see it. Yes. <laughs> well. But I guess they only go with the mirror look by themselves. Mm-hmm. Just go Snedeker. Go Messier. Go Snedeker. Get rid of it. You look better. You feel I like better. It. Go Snedeker. Exactly. Brant Snedeker, he's, he's revolutionizing how we feel about things and how, how grown men look. Uh, today and into the future so shout out to sneds um the memorial tomorrow we'll have our golf picks later this afternoon um we got ken holland coming up in 25 yeah. minutes i love it. they got a lot of time to kill i love it ken's coming up to uh, set up the series the gm of the edmonton oilers and we'll have to ask kenny about the experience factor what he makes of that Right. Well, he's you think he'll reference the Bills that. from the 90s? You think I don't know if he wants to slap around Bills Mafia again. Okay. Did, was there any blowback? Like, for, I'm uh, sure that – Who cares? You know, like, I mean, it's funny. I found it funny. We had Some guy wrote me last night. It's like, how could you 
how dare you take a run at Knobloch? He's just I'm like, dude, we're just joking around. You think I care about the nineties Bills? It's a yeah. it's a shrapnel comment that he pulled out of nowhere and he's trying to drive it home. That experience isn't the be all and end all, which he's gotta do because the Oilers don't have it. Right. You know, and as we established yesterday though, the Panthers don't have cup winning experience. They didn't win the Stanley Cup last year. Right. But I do I, I think it's a good question for Holland. We'll ask him that in twenty five minutes. You know, how are they how are they getting through the week? You know, you, you obviously want it to benefit you in terms of health, in terms of preparation, but at the same time, you're chomping at the bit. These guys realize like they're four wins away from their dreams coming true. So you want to get on the ice. And yeah. that's the Oilers, but it's also Florida. And I was having a conversation earlier this afternoon because there, there's so many different talking points, and especially with so much time off, there's a lot of different things to get into. And naturally, I think there's there's like a magnet that drags you towards McDavid, towards yeah. Dreisaitl. I think up here, the Oilers, because they're the Canadian team. And I think Paul Maurice takes up a lot of oxygen because he's on – you know, the comedy tour down there, he's always great with the mic and he's always got something to say and he's a compelling guy and a gregarious guy. But I will say, Matthew Kachuk seems to be sitting in the weeds and I'm curious what that guy's got up his sleeve because this time last year, he could barely breathe. Yeah. Like, he could barely <laughs> breathe and he, right. he should not have even been playing in the cup final. He had a broken sternum or broken something. Broken sternum. He is yeah. 100% healthy. To our knowledge. Yeah. And he's sitting there waiting. And an yeah. oiler killer from his flame days. Exactly. And remember his history with dry settle. I had forgotten about that. And I was yeah. reminded of it earlier. They used to have some wars and battles back in the day. And I guarantee you, Kachuk is thinking, give me, give me 29. And I don't yeah. think dry settle is going to run from it. Dry settle is a tough customer himself. And he, he wants that cup as much as Kachuk does. But I guarantee you, Kachuk will be looking for him early and often. I, I'm curious to see how that battle plays out. You know what? It's it's a great point because, you know, the the Panthers, the way that they have gone and just the way they conduct business, it's physical, it's fast, it's structured. They play kind of, you know, aggressive and go at it. And it was brought to my attention today, which is, and it was a good point. It's not my thought, but, you know, I – I, I put some thought to it afterwards is where's the line? Because you want to play tough. You want to play aggressive. Keep in mind, like Dallas, that series, that was almost a no hitter because Dallas was the least penalized team. Power plays were two one. Like, it'll be interesting to see if the Panthers want to, you know, cross the line. If they want to dare to send the Oilers to six, seven power plays a night, you're playing with fire there, mm-hmm. like that's. But you also want to be tough and push them back. So it, it'll be interesting. It's almost will the refs be a factor? Will the, well, I will, think you, know, you got to have a, You got to the guys huge have to factor. get together and say, look, we got to play our game. We're going to try to overwhelm them. We're trying to trying to be physical. But if you want to go to the box for a punch in the face in a scrum, it, it's it's nonsense. Like. Yeah. If you're going to drop your gloves and beat the piss out of somebody, then go ahead and do it and take the five minutes or whatever you're going to do. But if you're going to take a silly punch to the head because you want to be a tough guy, it might end up costing you a game. Well, and there's no there's no time for, you know, throwing away a game for a punch in the head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yet human element. Right. Like you mentioning noodles there. There is definitely a a big advantage on on Edmonton's side in terms of their special teams in general, not just their power play. Their kill is historically right. great. So they have to feel very comfortable about that. They feel, I'm sure, like they have the upper edge, although Florida's got a really good penalty kill as well. Yeah. But it is going to come down to whether or not the referee decides to call it and decides to put the whistles away or call coincidentals. And one thing that I would say about the Panthers that feels like a rarity, especially in the modern era, if they're losing 5-1, they're going to try to take a chunk out of you. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll go out of their They've way. they got old school in them. Yeah, but they if they're winning 5-1, they'll try to take a chunk out of you. That's <laughs> a rarity. A lot of teams that have the lead, they say, let's just get out of here, boys. They don't want to do that. They want to lead so they can punch you in the head more. 
Then they they're like, I'll take a penalty. We're up five one. I'll beat hey, the hell out of you right now. These guys in Florida, now. they might start punching people in the head if they're up four one. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's they that, might that, just yeah. say this is an opportunity for us to slap you that's around a little point. bit. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Where a lot of teams are like, I'm out of here. Four yeah. one. Just don't, let's get out of dodge. Guys. No stupid. No, no, stuff. no, no. They'll yeah. line brawl up four one. That's great. Yeah. They're looking for that. That that speaks to how they're wired. Because we saw, remember, we were laughing about it. Sam Bennett when they beat the Rangers. Yeah, he's yeah. trying to pick fights at the end of the game. They won. You yeah, know, like Mikola runs uh, Heedle with three seconds. Three left. seconds left. They won the game. Yeah, <laughs> and they're looking for for fights. But and that's to send you know, messages. Like, they're they're that, a different breed, man. It is, and I think that's where it's important. Like you know, Edmonton doesn't have to fight, but they have to show them that like we are. We're not going to be run out of the building. We're yes. not going to – like the Rangers, to me, on that play alone, that said a lot. They tucked their tail between their legs. They went out. They dressed the monster, and the monster played two shifts at the start of the game, and then that was it. Like nothing happened. That's why I keep coming back to it. I think it's important for the guys who are playing, the – the you know, Corey Perry's, the Darnell Nurses, the Evander Canes, guys who can play physical and push back. You know, Carrick is a guy who can do that. Mm -hmm. Like – those are the guys, when Florida starts to push, they, they don't wilt. I, I think you'll see Warren Fogel put back into the lineup at some point. McLeod's been a little shy uh, physically. So I, at some point, I think there is. Day RNA might draw back in for Broberg, big mm -hmm. six foot seven defenseman, depending on how things go. But it'll be interesting to see, because you're right, Hayes, they play the same way. Hey, we're bullies at 4-1 up or 4-1 down. Yes. And that's what's important is is to recognize what's going on in the game if you're the Oilers and how you want to play that. And I, I guess also never let your guard down. You know, talk to yeah. Heedle. Don't think, yeah, oh, it's five seconds left. Bennett's going to let that one go. He's not. Yeah. They're not going to let it go. And And I would say, conversely, if you get a chance to do that, do the same thing. Um, all right, so Ken Holland – in about 20 minutes, the Jays are losing 17 to three on aggregate through two games. Oh, I know. So uh, it's going really well down there at the Rogers Center, and they just got destroyed last night. I mean, I, I, I again, it's a home not run padding. fast. It's, I don't it's, know what's going on. They're getting crushed. Baltimore. Dude, I, it's quick on the trigger for me. I'm like four nothing. I'm like sorry, it's over, I can't. Man. I can't. Yeah, I can't. Because they don't have enough to come back. They don't have enough offense yesterday. I the tank to come back. Yeah. No. They, listen, it was. Uh, it was ugly last night, and Keegan's going to join us here in a moment. I want to play this John Schneider clip, though, after the game where he's got a bit of a different tone. I yeah. take a bit of issue with it because of who he's finally going at. You know, he's yeah. always been tipped the cap or, hey, we'll figure it out, or I trust these guys. Bowden Francis comes off the IL last night. He got crushed. Mount Castle's a beast. Here's what Schneider had to say about the two home runs that he gave up uh, through the middle of the game last night. You have to execute your pitches. And if you're throwing the middle of the zone, hoping for a good result, it's probably not going to happen against Ryan Mountcastle or against me if I'm hitting there. You know what I mean? So you have to execute. And, um, you know, we feel good about the plan going in. And it's up to the players to go out there and execute the pitches. And if you don't, that's what happens. So, listen, <laughs> the analysis is accurate. He's right. That first curveball that Mountcastle hit towards Spadina was a hanging <laughs> – <laughs> curveball. It was, it was like upper deck. Like yeah, it was. It was, it was. Oh. But Schneider, I haven't heard him say a peep about Vladdy watching balls right down the middle of the plate that he doesn't execute on. I haven't right. seen him say a peep about Bo Bichette or George Springer or anyone else who did nothing last night and has effectively done nothing all year, and they've made mistakes as well. Uh, here's Keegan Matheson of MLB.com. Keegan, what do you make of uh, – that analysis and how blunt it was from Schneider last night. That surprised me a bit, guys. When you see him looking in that direction, it's uh, typically at me. Uh, I'd asked him about the analysis of Ryan Mountcastle, who owns this team. He completely owns the Blue Jays. And to put that on the pitchers, I understand, but he went a bit further from that and said that he liked the plan going in, but it's up to the players to execute. I like that angle. I think more of it belongs on the hitters at this point. More of that belongs on the guys making big bucks who should be driving this offense, and a bit less of it on the pitchers, who have not gotten nearly enough help here so far. So the tone changed, the direction of that, maybe we'll see that uh, correct itself today, but I was surprised that so much of that went on the pitchers' staff. 
So, Keegan, what are we doing, or the Jays doing, organizationally moving forward? Is it just, I mean, you heard Ross the other day saying, oh, we want to lock up Bo, we want to lock up Vladdy. I, at this point, I don't even know how much sense that would make. I mean, where does that get you? I don't know. Just, this looks like it's just going to be one of those seasons that's a write-off. So what do you do from here? They are in a, such a tough spot. And guys, we need to get noodles like a Netflix or TSN Plus subscription or something. He can't be out here watching full ball games like that. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. The Blue it is. Jays are they're at risk of being caught in the middle. There's nowhere worse to be than the middle. The Orioles bottomed out a few years ago. Now look at them. They are who the Blue Jays wish they were. You can't get caught in the middle especially when you have Vladdy and Bo next year. It's all about Vladdy and Bo. It's always going to be about Vladdy and Bo in this era. Do they try to retool and pivot on the fly here? Maybe. But how's it going to be different next year? I think we said, guys, when we were talking before the season, I said that even if this team wins 100 games, I'm still saying prove it before game one of the playoffs. They're not going to win 100 games this year, I don't think. But how can this team prove it, that it's going to be any different? You would need big big changes and they're in danger of getting caught in the middle you don't want to be there look at the late 90s early 2000s they were caught in the middle and they lost a lot of people you you, you see it looking a little different sounding a bit different in here every night we've talked about this guys there's a lot of stuff to do in toronto if i have 200 bucks in my pocket there's a lot of ways to have fun you don't need to come to a ball game so it's it's about keeping these fans and giving them a reason, either success right now or hope for the future. It's that middle ground that's so dangerous. Now, Keegan, I've got to clarify. I had the game on, and I was fully engaged. And then you, you go to the bathroom, you come back, and there's been a dinger. So you rewind and go, what the hell's going on? And you're trying okay. to figure it out. The game I couldn't get away from. I do have a Netflix special. I, I do have all of the things that I do want to watch. <laughs> but for some reason, I couldn't look away last night. I'm like, I need to see how this ends because, you know, the fans, everyone was clearing out. It, it felt like the janitors were waiting for the game to be over so they could sweep up. But my question is, is there is there one thing that you could just put your, your finger on and say, this might help like even just help turn it around get them over 500 is it just is there one thing or is it just too many a combination of too many things that that have them sitting four games under 500 right now power it's all power look at the orioles every ball they hit is hard look at the first game of this series that game could have been 20 runs for the orioles they had i think seven fly ball outs to the warning track everything was hit hard the blue jays have fallen off as a power team since 2021. And I've always been a little confused with how they've talked about power. They often focus on the drawbacks of that, the risks you're taking. Well, power's cool. You can go out and make four errors, but if someone hits a three-run home run, guess what we're talking about that night? We're talking about Vladdy hitting a three-run bomb and the Blue Jays overcoming something. Look at those 15 and 16 Blue Jays teams. They weren't perfect. They did not lead the league in outfield defense. But my God, they made you forget about a lot of that because they hit home runs. The Orioles are a great example. The Yankees are another great example. Sucks to be in the same division as both of them, but they are playing a dominant type of baseball. You see how quickly it can flip, guys. Just with yesterday, leaving Henesis Cabrera in, he doesn't get his guy. Mount Castle, boom. The game's over. And for nothing, you can feel it. It's all about power. For this team it's hard to string together four hits against pitchers today keegan you mentioned how you spend your money or the opportunities to spend your money i think it was griff that posted a picture yesterday where it was like 30 minutes to opening pitch and there wasn't a ton of people in there and it's such a transition year was showing off the new ballpark have you got the sense that people are kind of turned off by this product and not really like the buzz isn't really there right now as it shouldn't be, but what are the what's the response of the fans in person? What does it look like? Yeah, and these are giveaway days, too. I mean, you're getting a, a bobblehead or a backpack or something most of these days. And the crowds have not been where I'd expect them to be. Now, you normally don't see it drop off completely. A lot of these tickets were sold four months ago. You'll see it later in the season. You'll definitely see it next season. My goodness, if they don't turn this around. But as a destination, in 15 and 16, this was a destination. When the Raptors were good, that was the cool place to be. It didn't even care if you were a Raptors fan. It was just the cool place to be in town. But you need to convince fans to not only buy tickets, but to pay for parking or to get into the city. 
I grew up on the East Coast. There's a lot of folks who don't live in Canada. You've got to convince people to take a trip here to watch the baseball game. You've got to convince them to pay 16 bucks for a tall boy of Budweiser. It's a little cheaper to drink at home. It's tough. There's so many other entertainment options in this city. A lot of them are pretty fun. So the Blue Jays need to keep a hold of those fans because you do see that a bit of apathy setting in. Apathy comes along with that middle ground we talked about, guys. It's a, a dangerous place, and especially as these tickets aren't exactly getting cheaper, especially when you look down right now at these fancy new club seats, uh, those do not sell themselves. You need to win to really excite people, and you do run the risk, and it's a big risk, of, of losing those people who don't live next to the stadium but who, who travel and make this a destination. With Keegan Matheson, MLB.com, Jays Orioles game three tonight. Um, what do you make of the new third baseman, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., playing third base? How are we feeling about that? Yeah, why not? Something <laughs> different. I mean, my goodness. you you got to try something. Vladdy, when he was in 2019, he was built a little different, a little more uh, top-heavy. Maybe that's how I'll call it. Um, he really struggled on balls coming in. So if he had to come in and bend over and then make a throw, it was pretty ugly. He is in better shape now. He's a little more calm at third base now. Yeah, it might cost you an error once a month, but why not? You need offense. This team is very good defensively. You need offense. You need to take some risks somewhere. Now, this is something that would get Justin Turner or Daniel Vogelbach into the lineup a bit more. Sometimes that's not something you're tripping over yourself to do, especially right now with Turner. But anything you can do to get offense into this lineup you got to do it. I think we'll see Vladdy there maybe once a week, something like that. But, hey, why not, man? Yeah. Well, you look you look at their lineup, card. Like, that that tells you all you need. Like, last night, yeah. Schneid, David Schneider leads off. Danny Jansen hitting second. Vladdy third. Vogelbach cleanup. Like, that's the old, if I had have told you, you'd say that team can't be anywhere close to 500. Like, if especially if I continued by saying, oh, no, Bichette's healthy and Springer's healthy and Turner's healthy. Like, they're, they're turning over the lineup. They're trying different things. And without Schneider, without Jansen, it's not a shot at those guys. They've been great this year. But they that was not the plan. Like, at no point was there a plan to have Schneider as your everyday leadoff guy and Danny Jansen hitting second. Vogelbach couldn't get into the lineup for the first month and a half. They have to play him. And not only is he in the lineup, he's hitting cleanup, Keegan. Like, that's all you got to look at to realize the issues here. Yeah, next spring, guys, yeah, like next February and March, if you catch me getting too serious, just remind me that none of that matters. Right. Nothing I'm writing about at that time matters. It, it, you couldn't project this. This was supposed to be Springer bouncing back. He looked good in spring. He really did. There was reason for optimism. Going into the season, I thought Boba Shett would get MVP votes. And obviously, I'm way off on that. But I really believed this was going to be a season for Boba Shett. And now you have Daniel Vogelbach, who I didn't know if he'd make this lineup, batting fourth. He's looked good lately, but this is not what it was supposed to look like. And the Blue Jays are not having any success stories. Yeah, you can have a guy have a bad year. It's okay if somebody sucks. That's going to happen every year. But you need somebody to surprise you. You need somebody from the bench to jump out and have that 850 OPS and balance it out. The Blue Jays have not had a lot of pleasant surprises as an organization. Not a lot of those success stories that surprise you. And that's how you get here. A place I didn't think they'd be is a lineup. Keegan, we look forward to your tweet at around 7.21 p.m. Eastern time, uh, announcing to the world that the Jays have not scored a run again in the first inning, which will be, what, 27 straight games without generating offense in the first inning? What are you going to eat tonight, more importantly? What are you going <laughs> to strap on to? Tell me. You know what? I, I haven't uh, ventured back in to see the, uh, the menu yet. Yesterday was fish, and I do not mess with fish this far inland, so today has no. got to be better. Today has got to be better. I uh, okay. I don't like to have fish this far from the coast, fellas. But uh, but yeah, stay tuned for that first inning run scoring journalism. Copy paste. Yes, you're owning it, <laughs> man. You're owning it. I love it. Uh, great catching up with you, Keegan. Enjoy it tonight. No fish, hopefully tonight. Get after it. Let us know what you're doing. Hey, you got it, fellas. Take care. Yeah, there's uh, Keegan Matheson of MLB.com. Twenty six games in a row, they haven't scored a run on the first inning. Yeah. How do you explain Bo? Hayes, like, how, how do you explain that? If somebody was from out of town and you were took him to a game and you're like, that guy for the past three years has been like an automatic shortstop stud where he's the guy to where he is now. What, like, 
Is it's it mind boggling, to- man. It because we're so deep into the season. You know, his reputation is he swings at everything, he strikes out a lot, but when he gets hot, you know, he he bundles yeah. together. Is like, it as simple as they got the book on him or what? Uh, it's possible. Yeah. You know, like he's been around the league three or two or three years, and it's like, okay, we know what you're all about. I, I, I mean, adjustments have been an issue for him throughout his career. He's had bad streaks, like every player does, obviously, but there have been different times early in his career where, like, he's in a he's in a rut here, he's got to adjust, or he's been red hot, and then it's like you got to adjust. Because um, remember last year, I believe it was, remember he got red hot in September, and prior to that it wasn't good. And we were talking about it all the time. He's got to make adjustments, right. you know, because – he gets up and he's uber aggressive. That's his reputation. He wants to swing. He's going to swing. And these guys are too good. Like they they know they're like, well, I'll throw something a little outside. He's probably going to chase it. Then he's then he's behind in the count. He's chasing the count. And it's just not a good place to be in. I and, like what David Ortiz said last night during the broadcast of the Red Sox game. He's like, as a hitter, you got to say, you can you can give the pitcher one half of the plate, but the other half's mine. I mm-hmm. thought that was that was a great yeah. little nugget from David Ortiz. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, how good Hall of Famer, one of the greats of all time, you know, and that's exactly it. He owned it. You want to throw something in my zone, I'm going to crush you, Um, which means the other one you've got, but it's a slim margin, you know, and the the best hitters, you know, they're, they're, they have, you have to be patient. You got to wait for the pitcher to make the mistake. You know, it's rare where you find a Vladdy senior who's chasing stuff like he's a cricket player, like. Most of you got to sit. You got to get ahead and count. It's baseball has been the same for a long time. It's now a power game. It's a velocity game. Guys are throwing heat all the time. It's different in terms of how pitchers are approaching it, but in terms of a batter's mentality, you got to wait for your pitch. And and Bo just doesn't seem to do that enough. And he's in such a rut where mentally, I think he's just lost it at this point because he's clearly not. It's not like he's forgotten how to play, or he's right. old and he's broken down. It's just this is a 60-game run here that has got him hitting deep into the lineup in something I did not see coming. Um, all right, Ken Holland, GM of the Oilers, coming up. His take on the week-long break, what it was like to win at home, what he makes of home ice advantage for the Panthers, cup experience for the Panthers. There's a lot to get into with Ken Holland, the GM of the Edmonton Oilers. He will join us next. All right, Jerry's coming up in an hour. Chris Pronger in about a half an hour. And uh, we'll catch up with Prongs. He knows what it's like to play in a cup final as an Edmonton Oiler. Obviously, he was there in 2006. And we got a guy on the line who knows what it's like to win the cup finals at GM. Obviously, he did that back in, in 2002. Detroit. Oh, you were on the wrong side of it? Yeah. yeah you were yeah. on the wrong side of it. But yeah. uh, now he's in Edmonton. He's been there for a number of years. And uh, nice enough to join us here. They've got some time off. Here's the GM of the Edmonton Oilers. Here's Ken Holland. How you doing, Ken? Good. Nice to be with you guys. Great to be with you as well. Are you enjoying your time off here? Are you considering <laughs> it a week off or what? Uh, it's a good time to kind of get uh, the batteries recharged, and uh, our guys are using the time to get, uh, um, you know, Monday was a day off, Tuesday was optional, good practice today. Full day of travel tomorrow, flying to Florida and practice Friday, and anxious to get going Saturday night. Yeah, it's it's going to be fun. I mean, uh, obviously, we're joking about the buildup because we've been talking about you guys every single day. And, you know, we've had a number of people on living in Edmonton, following it. You know, you've been through this in Detroit. Detroit's a great hockey market, obviously. But uh, take us back to game six, Saturday night. You beat Dallas. The aftermath, the buzz in the building, the city. How cool of an experience was that for you? Well, it was really incredible. incredible. I live across the street in the legends here, so... Uh... You know, you can hear them till all hours, uh, banging drums and uh, hooting and hollering and, and uh, celebrating. You know, obviously, it's been 18 years since the team has been in the Stanley Cup Finals, and the whole city is, uh, you know, just taking our team and uh, um, enjoyed the run with us. Um, I think that's what makes it special. Obviously, is the passion of the fans. Um, rink is jammed, and I've had so many people here in the last few days. People I didn't even, uh, relatives coming out of the woodwork looking for to help to buy tickets to the Stanley Cup final. So uh, certainly an exciting time. Ken, when, uh, at, at what point, I guess, did you know that you kind of had a, a special group here that, you know, could make to the final and, and, and challenge for the Cup? Because it wasn't, 
we'll call it maybe the smoothest of years. The you know from the start of the season, you had to make some changes. Uh, you've made some hard decisions, but when did you realize kind of this group kind of all came together? You know what, Jenny? You know I. You know, I reflect back on my time in Detroit, and, and you know, I can't read the future, but certainly uh, you're going to deal with adversity, and you're going to make steps forward and steps back. Um, you know, obviously we got to the Final Four two years ago. It's hard to get to the Final Four in the National Hockey League. 28 teams are at home, and four are only playing. Um, you know, and then we come back last year, and we had uh, higher hopes and bigger aspirations than the Final Four, and got beat in the second round by, uh, a, you know, the eventual Stanley Cup champion uh, um, Vegas team. And I, I, you know, we come into this year, I know that our guys come in two weeks early. They were committed to sacrifice some summer, wanted to make sure that we were ready to rock and roll. And you're two, nine and one, 12 games in and your head spinning. And uh, I knew we had a much better team than two, nine and one, but you, you, you got to win games. Um Difficult decision to make a coaching change. You know, kudos go to Jeff Jackson, who really uh, had a relationship with Chris Knobloch and knew a lot about Chris Knobloch. We get a lot of clients in there. I had interviewed Chris a few years ago for the head coaching job in Grand Rapids, and uh, we ended up uh, choosing Todd Nelson. Um, and he came in. The team really rallied around uh, around uh, Chris. And I think we played at the one or two or three highest points percentage from that point on now i think at the end of the day you, you know you, when you play at a high level that you, you feel you got a good team but certainly i think all those experiences were factors in us winning games six and seven against a really good vancouver team and being down two nothing in game four five minutes into the game when you're down two one in a series and it looks kind of bleak five six seven minutes into game four but there's a tremendous amount of belief in that locker room. And I, again, I think it's from the building. It's from the experiences. It's from, you know, winning big games during the regular season, facing adversity. Um, and then I thought the other night, again, game six, Dallas threw everything at us. We had, we, we mustered up 10 shots on goal. Uh, Dallas threw everything at us. And we, our guys were blocking shots. Stu Skinner was unbelievable. Special teams were obviously were a major factor. So I think it, I don't think there's any mo- one moment, Jamie. I just think it's been, you know, it's it's been, uh, you know, banging away and w- finding ways to win games and over the over the last couple of years, and it it it, it builds belief. Kenny Connor McDavid showed up in training camp, asked guys to come in early, said it's cup or bust. You saw the transition in Detroit with Stevie was there, a 150 point guy. Um, turned into a multiple cup champion. What like what have you seen out of Connor? What's the transition from these ultra skilled players where the winning? What's different when the winning comes into play? Where they might have had an idea in the past and now it's coming to fruition. What's different about the approach or just what happens to win with these great players? I think the the experiences of being in the playoffs. The NHL playoffs are way different than the regular season. The games are played different. Um, it's harder to score goals. You've got to deal with, with the pressures of, of a seven-game series over 80, 82 games. So I, I, it just an understanding. The more times you're in those playoffs, you know, I, I, I reflect back to the first year we played Chicago in the bubble. Um, and it's August. And it, you know, but Chicago had Kane and Taze and Keith, and they had won. And, you know we played and they beat us three games to one. And then the next year uh, we played Winnipeg. They did sweep us out, but, but three of the games went to overtime and one game was nothing, nothing in regulation. One game was one, one, I think one game was two, two. And we, we were playing, we started to play what I call playoff hockey. So um, I think, you know, with, with Connor, Connor, since I've been here, he, he plays, he's, He's all in every day in practice. He's all in every day in in the summertime. It's an incredible commitment. I just think it's being in for for all the players. That's what I learned in Detroit with the Eisermans and the Fedorovs and the Lidstroms and watching and the Scotty Bowmans watching our team. And we played you guys in 2002. Um, and I thought game game three when we go to triple overtime was you know we beat you guys in triple overtime and 
somewhere along the line, there's these big games and big goals are kind of shift shift the series. And I think you just got to you just got to be in those moments. And those, the players they're gonna they're gonna kind of get an understanding of what they what they've got to do. And obviously, a key to our team now has been you know the the, the penalty killing. Uh, we're comfortable in low scoring games. Um, you know, the other night we get two power plays. Uh, Connor and Leon, and again, and the power play produced two power play goals, and the penalty killing produces. I think the last two games were four, four for four in the power play, and they're they're zero for five or zero for six. So these games are the margin of error, uh, the margin is so close. It's decided on a play here and there, and 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 every every puck possession, every every I call them boo boos. When you you make too many boo boos, you you usually you're, it puts you out of the tournament. You got to manage the puck. You got to you just you just got to know how to play in Stanley Cup playoff hockey, and I just think that our team has been in. You know, we went to the final four last year, the second round. You know, this year we went through round one and then into round two, the Vancouver series. I thought all those experiences were big factors in us being ready to play our best game in Game Six and best game in Game Seven, and then you know we played a really good Dallas team, and uh, um, you know you want to win Game One and double overtime. It's they're just. They're, they're, mind, they're, they're just small margins, and our guys are comfortable understanding that these games are decided by small margins. With Ken Holland, GM of the Edmonton Oilers, and you know, you've referenced all these different experiences, Ken. Um, yet yeah, this will be a new one, the Stanley Cup final, and the opponent you're playing does have Stanley Cup final experience because they were in it last year. Um, how do you approach that, the idea that the Panthers have, have been there, they've seen it, they didn't win, but they've been there and seen it, um, and this is a the first experience for a lot of your players. Well, Brian, I think you nailed it. I mean, certainly they they've kind of gone through the last two years, but I've just kind of laid out. I mean, they they had to scratch and claw their way into the playoffs uh, on the last day last year, and then beat out the team that had the most wins and the most points in the history of the National Hockey League, and rode that right to the Stanley Cup Finals, and then watched the team celebrate. Um, those experiences probably served them well this year so uh, i think that, you know we've got a we've only got a couple of they obviously their whole team has kind of been to the finals we've got i think Ekholm was at the finals with nashville when they lost to pittsburgh Corey perry's been in the finals three or four times so this is a first experience for uh, for our team um i think that uh, but we, we we've been through again like i go back to the two nine one to start we've been we've had lots of adversity this year I really think it's going to be a tremendous series. I think both teams are battle tested and have been through lots of adversity over the last couple of years. Um, and um, we're going to get into Game One. I know our guys are excited to go. And then what ends up happening after Game One? Then then the adjustments start. You know, whoever loses makes some adjustments, and adjustments go back and forth. But we're we're feeling good about ourselves. Um, you know, we're, we're we're pretty healthy. You know. And uh, we're 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 excited about the opportunity. It's the opportunity of a lifetime, really, for uh, for for players on both teams. So uh, we're ready to roll. Ken, I wouldn't uh, be me if I wouldn't ask you about the goaltending. Uh, you know, you look at uh, Stuart Skinner, and you know he had a season. You mentioned the two nine and one start. You make the decision with Jack, and then you know you basically hand the the keys to the car to Stuart, and and he. You know, he settles in as your number one. I think he did a really good job last year as well. There's been some growth there. But, you know, what do you make of his growth? And, you know, how hard was it, I guess, it would be maybe a, a different question, how hard was it to kind of allow him that pathway to grow? Because I'm sure there was probably a few moments where it's like, okay, you might need to get him some help type of situation. But, uh, uh, you, you know, look, you look like a genius right now sticking with him because he's been fantastic. Well, you know, I, mean, I got you know, obviously I got to watch him play in Bakersfield, and I think the year before he got to that was the um, you know the COVID year. They won the the Pacific Bakersfield won the Pacific Division. There were two or three best of threes, and Stewart played all the games, and you know he might have had one one a bad game, but he would always bounce back. And then and then he, he you know so I sort of watched his growth, and then last year in the playoffs, um, he was a rookie and. I, you know, was, and it was, there was learning moments there for for him, uh, but he had you know he had like 29 wins as a rookie in the National Hockey League, which is hard to get. This year he comes back with 
with 36 wins. Um, when we made the dec- when I made the decision to put Jack on waivers, really I thought it was going to be. First off, I just wanted to try to do something to kind of jolt the team, get their attention, because I believe they were better than what they were at. You just, I had to do something, so put Jack on waivers. Um, uh, you know, figured with his contract, obviously he wasn't going to get picked up. The plan was to bring Jack back. Well, Stu played so good, and there was such wonderful chemistry between Pickard and Stu Skinner. As we went along and went along, there was no there was no reason to make any 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 change. So you know, you, you just keep watching and you keep watching and you keep watching. And both we had great chemistry in net. Uh, both goalies played good. Pick could sit for a long stretch of time and go in and play good, so we had a really good. And then we we knew we had Jack Campbell as the number three, and we we kind of ran it all year that way. And I think that factored into Chris Knobloch in game after game three against Vancouver, deciding to go to Pick. Pick he knew that Pick believed that Pick was going to play good after a long stretch because he had done that multiple times during the year, and that was probably a key moment for for our team too and for. Uh, or for Stu Skinner, he got a chance to kind of get three, four days away, reset. I know that Dustin Schwartz and uh, Stewie worked hard on uh, on a few things and a few drills over those four days. And when Stu got back in, um, he's, he's been right on top of his game. And sometimes you just, as an athlete, you just need a moment in time to kind of reset. You know, things are maybe going a certain way. And I think that that was an opportunity for Stu to reset. And he's been, uh, been excellent ever since... Uh, that moment in time and you know he's 25 years of age you know i've I've watched you know chris osgood and some of those goalies that i had in in detroit and watched the kind of the growing pains and people want to race out to you know when when players are 23 and 24 years old and oh they can't do this or they can't do that they're still they're still fairly young pups in the whole grand scheme of things but also understanding that you know when you looked at our at our team with connor and leon and and then and, and Zach Hyman and, and, and Nuge and Darnell Nurse and where they were at their moment in time that, you know, you, you can have so much patience, but you can't have too much patience. So I guess that's certainly the experiences that I've been through. And you go by the, your gut instincts and your experiences and your beliefs. And um, you hope that you're going to be right more times than you're wrong. You're not, you can't be right all the time. But certainly uh, everybody in the organization believed in Stu Skinner. I know that he's got great belief in him. He was a runner-up for the Calder Trophy uh, last year. Um, he's 25 years of age, and I just think that he's just coming into his own and to be a a really you know top-end National Hockey League goalie. But it just it just takes it. it you got to go through these growth moments. Well, your whole team obviously went through them, and uh, the payoff in the end is is that you're going to the Cup final, and uh, it's going to be. It's going to be a lot of fun, obviously, for us. We just get to watch and be entertained. You guys are right there uh, in the grind. So safe travels down there. Good luck, Ken. Really appreciate you doing this. I know it's a busy time. No problem. Thanks, guys. You got it. Ken Hall and the GM of the Oilers. Um, yeah. Great answers. Pretty Listen, good insight, I'll tell you that. He's like, been around. Like, Kenny Holland's seen it all, man. He's seen it all. And, you know, his future – we didn't. I was going to try to get it in at the end, ask him about his future, but he's in the cup final. He's not, he probably doesn't want to get into what he's going to do in the future. But I do, I wonder, you know, is it tied to what happens here? Success? Do you run it back? Jeff Jackson's there now, obviously, at the top. And, but Ken Holland's made a lot of great moves, and he can speak to his experience. You know, he's yeah. seen it, he's done it. And like you said, you're not going to always get it right. Sometimes no. you, you will get it wrong, but. More often than not, they obviously got it right because they're in a cup final right now. I'll tell you what, that experience with Kenny in 2002, I'll have a memory like burnt into my brain. I remember shaving my beard because it's it's a big beard when you go to the finals. I was shaving beside Aaron Ward, and then I heard it. Steve Iserman, come and get the Stanley Cup. And I, I just, I, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and I hear that because it was so, <laughs> the fans Nightmare were fuel. so horny. And then this guy comes out and he's like, Steve Iserman. Yeah. And I just, I'll never forget that day. Like, because half of my beard was gone and that's when Jerry started talking. Yeah. 
Well, how I'll, about ne- the, I'll never forget hearing that. The dagger, the th- triple OT dagger by Kenny there, just so you, yeah, d- yeah. you don't. Larry Onoff. Larry Onoff on Artie Urbe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, yeah, It was tied though. 1-1, right? It was one, you, guys, you guys get a bounce there. You're up 2-1. Who knows yeah. what happened? I think, I mean, obviously Detroit had elite talent, but they were, they were not a young team. I think mm-hmm. if we had to squeak that one out, we might have had a better chance. Yeah. Because yeah. that was a swing game, man, where it was like whoever had – like that was triple overtime, and whoever had the mojo after that game was probably going to win game four mm-hmm. or have a leg up anyway. And I don't know. We won game one too, and I was like, we're up 1-0 against the Red Hots mm-hmm. yeah. with Iserman, Fedorov, Shanahan, all of them, Larry Onoff. Chelly. It was all Chelios, them, yeah. Lidstrom. It's like we go in and steal game one, and then it was an absolute smoke show. <laughs> Yeah, well, smoke show. Anyway, yeah. uh, he he's got a great memory on all those different yeah. references, right? All the different sure, things yeah. that took place, and uh, great to catch up with Ken Hall. We appreciate that. Chris Pronger in about fifteen. Jerry's percentages. There it is. At five thirty, overdrive continues. TSN ten fifty and on the TSN app. All right, Chris Pronger. Jerry's percentages. Our picks for the Memorial coming up, and um, the NBA Finals kicking off tomorrow. You see. Like the reports are indicating, JJ Redick and the Lakers, it's happening, and he's he's still doing an analysis work through the NBA Finals. But basically, when that comes to an end, sounds like Redick and LeBron will do their podcast, and then they'll get out there and they'll play for the Lakers, Dude, play and it's, coach. It's, it's insane. It's going to be wild. Twenty four. How a guy can do a podcast with another guy, and then he's going to be the coach. Like. If you didn't sniff this one out, give me give your head a shake. Yeah, but it, it really is the most twenty twenty four story. It is story of a guy's all doing time. a podcast, drinking red wine with another dude, and then he becomes the coach. Now he's team. a coach. And if LeBron's you know lagging ass on practice or in a game, you know JJ's got to got to coach him. You know he's not he's not your co host anymore. I love that opportunity to be your coach, both of you. Just bury you guys. Just bury you too, dude. I'd love to be your coach. You'd be in the press box because you're not good enough. <laughs> That's a good, good comeback, good retort. You're right. I'd play you, and I'd play into the ground. I'd say, no, you stay out there. I'd Mike Keenan it. No, no, oh, stay yeah, out. Oh yeah, the Kovalev seven. Yeah, no, 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 you stay out there. Ten minute yeah. shift. That's how I'd rule. I'd pull myself. <laughs> I'd bench you. I'd bench you. <laughs> All right, hour two coming up. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN two.